Hello, everyone. Uh, this is another episode of uh, Unisoft Law YouTube show where I interview a wide range of fascinating people that mostly interest me, but I'm also hoping that they will uh, interest the audience, uh, a wide audience, and uh, mostly professionals from Toronto or nearby regions. So today we have a very special topic. We want to talk about law school and articling. And I have a special guest. Her name is Adrian Zaya. She's, uh, despite just having been called to the bar, she's already a really interesting professional with a really interesting background. So without further ado, I will pass the floor to Adrian and I will let Adrian talk about herself, uh, where she's from uh, academically, uh, uh, very briefly, and then we'll dig into details. Adrian, nice to have you. Very nice to be here, Pula. Thanks so much for the warm welcome. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you today. Love everything that you're doing with the interviews. Um, so as Pula mentioned, my name's Adrian. I uh, obtained my law degree from the University of Kent in England. So not your typical uh, career path for a lawyer in Toronto. Uh, upon completing my, uh, my law degree in England, I always knew that I wanted to come back to the Toronto region. And so that's exactly what I did. Um, it was a bit tricky navigating the legal market, which you kind of touched upon earlier, Pulat, uh, and we can dig into that later. Um, but I managed to secure a position at Denton's Canada in Ottawa. And I just recently completed my articles there and have been called to the bar. Thank you, Adrian. Let's start from the very beginning. What was your pre-law school academic background? So pre-law school, I had gone to the University of Toronto. I thought that I wanted to be a doctor for some time. <laughs> and so I enrolled into the life sciences, quickly realized that that lifestyle wasn't for me and switched into psychology. And so I completed a psychology specialist with a biology minor at the University of Toronto. What was wrong with life sciences? Really interesting about these career switches and decisions. For sure, yeah. So life sciences, I found it to be, I just didn't feel that I would get much satisfaction out of it. A lot of it was, you know, academic and, uh, you know, research-based and a laboratory environment, but I really like interacting with people. Uh, so I just didn't feel that it was a good fit. Um, and then the long journey ahead um, I didn't, I wasn't interested in getting a PhD, for example. So I just had to shift gears uh, with that growing sense of self-awareness. And you switched to, again? Psychology. So you, you were under the impression that studying psychology will increase your chances of meeting other people and working with other people, correct? That's right. Yeah. And helping them solve their problems. And uh, did psychology meet your expectations? It got me closer to the mark. Um, but I mean, I guess to backtrack a little bit about who I am as a person, I always have been a little bit more entrepreneurial too. So although I enjoyed psychology, I liked the people aspect of it. And I could see how I would be helping people from a practical standpoint. I just didn't see how I would be able to also exercise that entrepreneurialism that I had deep within me. I'm really curious about uh, your entrepreneurialism. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pronounce that word. Uh, I'm really curious about you, this drive that you had, and uh, I assume uh, it was. Uh, it, you can also say that you had a drive to start a business or to start to build something to uh, put resources and people together to generate some value, right? Uh, I will use this long. Uh, expression this long phrase as as a replacement for the word that i have difficulty pronouncing so anyway where's that drive from that comes from i would attribute that to my parents um so they are immigrants uh they came to this country with um practically nothing and really just made a living for themselves from the ground up um so just watching them do everything that they do day in day out and really um, give everything they've got to give me and my siblings a lifestyle that we have um, and just to give us opportunities and things like that. I, you know, I really observed that and took it to heart. And I think that it by osmosis kind of, I adopted that entrepreneurialism as well. So when you felt that studying psychology would satisfy your entrepreneurial 
urges or needs or interests, uh, did you think about starting your own therapy practice or uh, something like that? I didn't think that far in advance just because I knew the immediate next steps. I mean, pursuing a, psych a career in psychology is, you know, you get your master's and your PhD and a lot of it is academically, you know, it's based in academia before you actually do get to practice and, you know, you've got to develop a solid foundation before you do open up your own um, clinic or something like that. So um, for those reasons, I just didn't feel it would be a good fit. Um, you know, you'd have to endure a lot of, you know, long hours and a lot of time of just kind of doing research and stuck in the books, your, with your head in the books, uh, doing academia before actually jumping into assisting people from a practical standpoint. Did you have dreams about starting your own business and did you see what that business would look like? Um, I've thought about it. I feel like that's something that I've always wanted to do. Um, I haven't dreamed what it would look like just yet because I don't know exactly what I would want to do. Um, I'm still learning a lot. I'm still growing a lot. Um, but I do think that that will come in the future sometime when I can't say and what it will be. I'm not entirely sure just yet, but I think I would like to do that. When you got your undergrad, your bachelor's, where were you in life? So what do you mean by that? <laughs> Well, I mean that uh, if you had certain, uh, uh, if, you, if you had certain uh, even uh, rough roadmap, right? When you went mm -hmm. into your undergraduate program, where on that roadmap were you? What, what was your immediate next plans or were you not really sure about what to do next? I'm trying to see if you're one of those people who always knew what they wanted or if it was more okay. of an of exploration. That makes sense. Uh, yeah, no, it was more of exploration for sure. So I wasn't, I was never someone who always knew, you know, I wasn't born knowing that I want to become a lawyer or anything like that. So I really just kind of went through life's experiences and kept an open mind and was eager to explore different avenues, um, you know, dipping my foot into different areas of things that I can just get experience and get a feel for what practicing psychology is like, practicing, um, you know, biology is like, uh, and then kind of taking, drawing on those experiences to, um, kind of formulate the roadmap going forward. Did you go to law school right after getting your uh, undergraduate degree? Uh, yes, yes I did. Okay. Tell me why you decided to go to law school after uh, finishing your undergraduate program at the University of Toronto. Sure, so again, drawing on that, um, that theme that I mentioned of experiencing a bunch of different things and formulating uh, the roadmap going forward and the growing sense of self-awareness. Uh, I just thought law would be a great uh, avenue to go down because first of all, it, it is a business, right? Law firms are businesses at the end of the day. So I would be able to uh, exercise that entrepreneurialism, getting clients and things like that. Uh, but also I do like academia. Um, I do like research. I do like helping people from a practical standpoint, um, you know, solving their problems. So all of those things combined, it seemed like law would be the perfect avenue uh, to, to pursue. What were your sources of information about law when you decided to go to law school? Um, so I had, speaking to, I had been speaking to a lot of professors uh, at the University of Toronto. I had a lot of great mentors. Um, my older sister too, I should mention. So she, she was the first one to go to law school. And so she told me how much she enjoyed it. And she told me what her experience was like in law school. And so that prompted me to also pursue law. Oh, wow. Interesting. Very interesting. So tell us now why you decided to go to the UK. Okay. So the UK, I have always wanted to study abroad. Um, you know, at the University of Toronto, I was very local. So the commute is about 30 minutes and I've always been close to home. Um, so I thought, um, you know, if I'm not going to be pursuing school, after my, you know, whatever postgraduate degree I get, now's a chance to study abroad if I want to do that. Um, and so I went for it. I love to travel. So that was definitely a big push in favor of going to the UK. Um, and also I'm someone who values personal growth. I value that very, very much. And so I thought that by going abroad uh, for the first time away from my parents, quite a distance away, I'd be a great, uh, great opportunity to learn 
get my law degree, which would uh, set me up for a successful career um, in Toronto as a lawyer, um, but also just get to experience experience lights, experience another culture, experience people. Um, so I really, I'm really glad that I did that. You know, you're not the first person I know for whom getting away from the appearance was a, a major factor in choosing their um, school. So there's nothing wrong with that, <laughs> I think. I yeah. totally get it. Yeah. All right. So was it hard to get into uh, University of Kent uh, law program? Um, I mean, I think it's difficult, just like every other kind of application process. Um, so you apply and hope for the best. Uh, I will note that uh, going to law school in the UK, you don't need the LSAT. Um, mm -hmm. So if you can, if that makes it easier, I'm sure it does kind of financially and, you know, you don't have to study for, a, for an entry level exam. So um, in that sense, I guess you could say it's easier. Right. Um, I know you didn't go to law school uh, in Ontario. By the way, I have no idea about law schools outside of Ontario. Right. Uh, I don't know. In BC or Quebec. Quebec is definitely different. But um, you probably talked to uh, your fellow articling students, law students, and maybe you have some idea about what Canadian or Ontario law schools are like. And if you don't, let me know. But I'm curious to compare a, a British law school and an Ontario law school because I had a, a lawyer on the show recently and uh, he went to law school in the, in the US. And there is a difference between a US law school and a Canadian law school. And this difference is called the Socratic method, right? It's teaching by asking questions. So is there any difference you're aware of between British law school and Ontario law school? It's pretty hard for me to say. Um, I haven't really spoken too much about what it's like, um, you know, what law schools in Ontario are like. Uh, I do know that there are different methods of exams. Students love to talk about the exams that they had to take. So I do know that, um, you know, in England, it's a closed book exam and you've got to memorize case law and things like that. Uh, whereas in Ontario, it's an open book method is my understanding. So, uh, but I don't know too much about the actual programs and opportunities and, and things like that? It varies. Uh, it depends on the professor. Some uh, exams are open book, some are closed book. I myself have very vague recollection of law school. It was a difficult time. Uh, and uh, I have a tendency to erase dif difficulties from memory. But I definitely remember closed book exams as well. So did you find, now obviously you uh, worked as an articling student in a Canadian law firm when you returned to Canada, uh, did you find, and you are familiar with the British legal system and with British law, did you find, was it wasn't obvious to you that our legal system uh, is descended from theirs? Um, yeah, I would say so. I mean, I, I've realized a lot of similarities when I'm you know, doing um, research, legal research. I realized that a lot of the law is very similar to that of the UK. Um, and yeah, I mean, the system is of course derived from from that of the UK. So it is apparent and it is neat to see kind of our roots. Uh, so it was, I really enjoyed that aspect of studying in the UK. Uh, I, have you seen any cases that, um, you know, um, there was a, the, the, there are cases like the carbolic ball case here <laughs> in Canada, right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure I remember we studied some cases, uh, some decisions written by Lord Denning Yes. You know, and other British uh, jurists. Uh, did you find that you studied some of the same cases in, in Britain that we study here in Ontario? Oh, for sure. I mean, as you mentioned, carbolic smoke ball is one of them. A lot of contract type cases. There was the one, oh, the name is escaping me. It's the classic one with the snail, um, the snail and the ginger beer. Um, it's a contract law oh, case. Don't, don't, don't look at me. I have no oh, idea. No. I'm, I'm really bad with remembering those historic cases. So, oh my, but, you so know, my. this is interesting. You know, what's curious, um, were you exposed to uh, litigation practice while you were in law school in Britain at all? Um, I think, and I think yes, in the same way that students are in Ontario. So opportunities to move, for example, 
Um, so through extracurriculars, like you get that very, very on point experience. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever seen the inside of a British court or something like that? Or, or I, a tribunal? I did see the inside of a court. Yes, I did. And uh, I mean, I'm sure you saw the inside of a, an Ontario court. Uh, is it very different? Do they wear wigs there? What is it like? <laughs> so they, they do have their wig wearing tradition, um, but mm -hmm. the court itself, I mean, it's, it's very similar. Mm -hmm. It's very similar, I would say, yeah. You know that uh, we are now even giving up the robes here because of Zoom. So oh, really? I'm wondering, yeah, well, last I checked, you don't have to wear a robe uh, in Zoom hearings anymore. Yeah. So uh, we're moving away from that tradition. And uh, it's interesting that in Britain, they still uh, stick to wigs. And uh, some argue that wigs and robes level the playing field because, you know, you don't end up wearing an Armani suit when the other lawyer is wearing uh, something less expensive and that way influencing the court. But at the end of the day, judges know very well usually who the lawyers are so I'm, I'm not sure if wigs and robes really level the playing the playing field what do you think about it um i mean that's definitely um an interesting point to raise that it loving levels the playing fields i think it it might um and i i mean it's kind of nice to see that the traditions are still being maintained um i personally like the whole robing so i would be sad to see that go um, that's my take on it. <laughs> Did you have to rope for your call to the bar this year? No, so mine was administrative, unfortunately. So I didn't get a ceremony, um, which I'm pretty sad about. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that they're going, they're saying that they're going to try to have one um, once kind of the coast is clear, but I'm not going to hold my breath. <laughs> I'll just kind of continue. How did it go this year? Tell us about uh, being called to the bar. Well, first of all, finishing your article this year, right? Um, yes, yeah. yeah, so I just finished you my finished article. Your, you finished your article and you got called to the bar in the year of, of the plague. Right. <laughs> like uh, in uh, some uh, Gabriel uh, Garcia Marquez book. Uh, so, First of all, when did you take the bar exam? So I took those um, at the beginning of my articles. So that right, was, so last year. Yeah, yeah, so Fine. in May. So tell me about, tell me the whole thing, like how did it go? You finished your article in, in March, but it was already the COVID month. It was already yeah. the COVID time, right? So tell me yeah. about it. Yeah, COVID was peaking and it was definitely, I mean, a little bit scary. It was. I mean, we've never really experienced anything like this where the entire globe really just shuts down. Uh, so it was a bit daunting kind of heading into that uh, type of environment. Um, but me, I mean, I'm personally kind of a grand optimist. So I, I didn't let it kind of get to me too much. I just kind of continued. As soon as I finished my articles, um, you know, I, I sought out my like a first year associate position. Uh, so I just kind of kept going. Um, but you know, it is, it is a tricky time to navigate. And the great thing is that we're all in this together. So it's not like there's any one, one person who's kind of disadvantaged by this. We're all in it together. We're all a support system. It's important that we stick together and give each other um, encouraging advice. The, the bar has been really great too. So I've reached out to a lot of lawyers, yourself included, Pulat, and you've been super kind and giving me advice and tidbits um, that you know, I can kind of implement into what I'm doing in my job search strategy um, and just how to kind of keep on top of case law and keep, mm -hmm. uh, keep developing upon my skill set um, and experience that I developed during my articles. Well, you're certainly a very special person. Uh, you, for example, you break stereotypes. I'm sure some people have a stereotype about uh, foreign law school graduates finding articling positions or not rather finding articling positions. You yep. not only broke that stereotype, you kicked that stereotype uh, out of the field entirely uh, by getting an articling job at Denton's, which I, I, I think everybody has heard about. Seems to be a decent firm, right? So how did that, how did you do, how did you manage that feat? 
Um, so as I alluded to before, it, it definitely was tricky. It was more difficult, um, you know, coming out of an Ontario law school, um, you have the advantage of having had the opportunity to network with, um, you know, your professors uh, who also are practicing lawyers um, and they can attest to your ability and things like that. There's also the resources, for example, the on-campus interviews. Um, so you have a whole bunch of resources when you go to law school in Ontario. And so as soon as I came back, um, I realized that. Um, and so I set out to establish my own set of resources. So I started networking. I started meeting people, um, getting advice as to where I can look to find job opportunities and articling positions and things like that. Um, I drew upon, again, my mentors. They really assisted me with, uh, you know, the whole cover, cover letter writing process. Uh, how to fix up my resume so that it's in accordance with what some of these big Bay Street firms are looking for. Um, so it really was a lot of groundwork, um, or grunt work, I should say, um, a lot of groundwork and just kind of trying to pull upon all your resources and, um, and, and finding new ones and, um, and yeah, just never giving up really. So you, you have to be ready to face a lot of no's, which I certainly did. Um, I have Excel spreadsheets of just no, no, no written across them. Um, just keeping tabs on my efforts in managing in uh, landing an articling position. Um, but yeah, I think, I think persistence pays uh, and hard work certainly pays and you just kind of can't get discouraged too easily. You have to keep plowing forward if you know what you want. Um, and that's really how I ultimately uh, ended up articling at Denton's. Well, let's drill into this a little bit. Now you started from uh, more general and then you slowly uh, went into more specific and uh, you started with networking, which was a very general advice network, right? And yeah. everybody says that, but you obviously have a networking secret or a secret weapon that we want to talk about today. Right. But then you continued on to mentors, which is more specific now, right? But Again, everybody says talk to mentors, but you know, it's super hard to find good mentors or right. uh, it's uh, hard to sometimes to use mentors effectively or to give them something back right in return uh, when you're just starting out. So, and then the third thing you said uh, was this Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. And that was very specific. Right. So uh, yeah. in the same order, I want to go from general to specific and I want to drill down into each one. So networking, what is your networking secret weapon, Adrian? Okay. Uh, so there's really no secret weapon. I mean, I just kind of would cold email and cold, well, I wouldn't cold call, I would cold email first um, and try to set up a phone call. Um, so sometimes lawyers would get back, sometimes they don't, but that's okay because the ones that do get back to you, those are the ones that you, you know, you go on to set up a, a phone call with and, and ask them for advice um, and just, again, learn about their insights and, and how you can kind of improve what you're doing to help you secure an articling position. Okay. Um, yeah. So sorry for, for interrupting. Approximately okay. how many cold calls have you made before you found your article position? Oh my goodness. I, I don't know. I don't even have a ballpark number. So when I came back, I was applying before I was ready. I should mention that. And what I mean by that is that I came back and I had to do my NCA exams, the oh. national committee on accreditation, the administer exams. I had seven of them. Um, and so I figured that, um, I mean, I guess maybe I have to backtrack a little bit. So England, um, law school in England is two years. I came back after having done two years and then I had to do my NCA exams. So I figured that I was the equivalent of a 2L um, in, in Ontario. I think that's what that would be called. And so I was applying for 2L positions, articling positions, because I know they um, recruit a year in advance. So I was throwing myself at almost every opportunity um, trying to see, um, you know, where, where I would fit. So it's kind of a gauging process too, to see where I would fit. Would I be an articling, uh, would I fit into the articling recruit or the, the summer student recruit? Uh, so I was doing a bit of that. Um, 
to that answer your question. So, so you you created categories and you you essentially you use an analytical approach to your networking. You try to yes. just fit uh, calls or people into these categories into these baskets, so you have a more efficient uh, approach and maximize maximize output. That's that's really nice. Uh, so that's networking. Okay. We should probably have a whole separate uh, interview with you on networking. I'm sure a lot of law graduates or law students can learn a lot from you about that. Now, mentors. Yes. What is your mentor finding recipe? Um, again, it's hard to say. There's no real recipe. I mean, you, you reach out to people and you speak with them and then you, it's just a matter of how much you click with the person. Um, and how you know you you encounter some people who are really willing to go above and beyond. Some people might say, you know, feel free to send me your cover letter. I'll have a look at it, and I'll you know I'll get back to you. And so you do that. And wait, so basically, ask and you shall receive. Is this what you're saying? Essentially, I mean, I never asked anyone to review my cover letter. I was too hesitant to to go that far. I was appreciative of just the what? call. What did you ask? What did you ask people when you, when you called? Did you ask so, them to be mentors, for example? No, so I never explicitly, I don't think I ever really, you know, said you are my mentor to anyone. I think it just, it's an informal mentorship. Um, mm. so, in, so mentors can be formal. You know, there are a lot of organizations that have um, like a formal structure where you can sign up and be assigned to a mentor. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it is more informal. So I would say all the mentors that I have have been informal um, and I consider them to be mentors, whether they consider me to be their mentee or not. I'm not sure, but. Yeah, I know it's, it's what you identify uh, this relationship as that matters. Uh, yeah. But uh, roughly how many mentors like that do you have? Oh boy. Um, I would say, so to begin before articling, I would say I had two. Um, and that's being very um, generous. Uh, no, cons I would say conservative with uh, conservative. With okay. Yeah, yeah. So I would say two, two that I really had coming out of articles. Though, I mean, I feel like everyone at the firm was really great. So I feel like I can draw upon any of them to to give me advice. So I feel like all of them are really my mentors. I mean, I still keep in touch with them to this day, um, and I know that I'll, I will continue to keep in touch. So I was able to form really good relationships, um, but. So yes, mm -hmm. that, I feel like maybe that is more on the liberal side, but before I was more conservative with the two mentors. Uh, do you have any uh, arrangements where you can, where, where you have regular meetings or calls with someone, uh, you know, check-ins? Uh, I don't with any of my mentors, no. Um, so I just kind of take it upon myself to touch base with them, let them know where, you know, where I'm at or where I'm headed or kind of what's going on in my life. Um, I feel like that's the best approach um, just because, I mean, if you schedule something, if you don't have anything to really update on, it's kind of inefficient in that way. Um, but I think it's important to, uh, you know, take that initiative to reach out to your mentors, mm -hmm. let them know where you're at, and then also add a note to say, I'll let you know, um, I'll touch base in the coming weeks to let you know, you know, how things go, or if, you know, if you're, let's mm -hmm. say, interviewing or something like that. Mm -hmm. All right, how do you make it uh, so it's not a burden for people to be your men mentors? So instead they feel like they're getting something out of it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> so I think the people that I've come across have been the, you know, they have just been happy to give back because they are the ones who have also been in, in my shoes um, and have drawn upon their own mentors. And so they know what it's like. And so I, I don't get the sense at all that they feel burdened. Um, and I think, um, you know, you have to be cautious when kind of thinking that you're burdening someone because some people are genuinely super, super happy to chat whenever and ready and willing to hop on a call whenever you need it. Um, so I've never felt personally burdened. What's the age bracket uh, of your mentors, if any, or is it all over the place? Uh, I mean, I, I, know the, I know the whole out of a office of dentons is your mentors. I understand that. <laughs> that's a lot, a huge range, but you yeah. know, the, the top 10 or the top five. I say they're all over. 
I'd say they're all over. And I think that's important to have a little bit of diversity too, because you have, let's say, maybe mentors in there who are, you know, 20 years out of practice, um, and they can tell you things that you wouldn't be able to first see, um, given your, your current situation or the stage that you're at. And then it's good too to have um, people who are in the same boat as you, um, who have, can tell you how they are navigating a particular situation that may be um, of direct relevance to you. Are you saying that you treat uh, your peers, such as fellow article students, as mentors as well? I would say so, yeah, for sure. There's no reason that they can't be. That's great. I, you already mentioned that some mentors offer to check your cover letter, maybe a resume. What else do mentors do for you? Um, I mean, they give you really great advice. Again, as I mentioned before, so they could be people who are 20 years out and they can tell you what they would do if they were in your shoes or, um, you know, they think back to, oh, when I was your age, I wish I had known this or I wish I had known that. Uh, and so it's helpful to kind of learn through other people's experiences so that you don't have to go through the same type of thing and experience the same type of maybe it's a failure or maybe it's a not so great uh, career choice or something like that. Do you consider yourself an overachiever? <laughs> um, maybe, I'm not sure. I'm very type A and I do like to, I mean, I set my sights high and I have pretty focused tunnel vision when I want something. Uh, you know, uh, obviously athletes are generally considered to be type A, a you know, personalities and achievers and uh, athletes are often uh, models for us when we want to achieve something we look at some olympians we look at some champions right and for athletes and a lot of people really borrow that from the athletic world for athletes fitness and nutrition is really where it's at right Bes and, and mental training mental training is huge and in litigation I think when you practice litigation, it's like a sport and you have to keep yourself fit mentally and physically. Do you have any tips? Do you do anything in that department? Mm, yeah, I mean, I've always been um, conscious about what I'm eating. So nutrition has always been pretty, pretty big to me. Um, and exercise has always been um, something that I valued a lot. I've, you know, recently during the quarantine discovered uh, running, so I fell in love with running, and I really realized the the therapeutic effects. It's it clears your mind. It you know you think about problems better. Uh, so I'll do that first thing in the morning, and it'll just set the tone for the rest of the day. And I feel amazing going forward. And you know I'm ready to tackle whatever task is ahead of me for the day. That's great advice. <laughs> Look, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation and I enjoy talking to people like you. I'm not surprised why people offer to ch check your cover letters and uh, give you advice. You have a great personality. It's really interesting to chat with you. I wish you all the best. I know you are at, uh, at uh, a crossroads right now. You are interested in a, uh, an associate position, correct? That's right, yeah. Yes, and uh, I'm sure that you will be a fantastic lawyer. You are already a lawyer and uh, you have a great career path in front of you. I thank you for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. And I hope to talk to you again soon. All the best, Thanks. Adrian. Thanks so much, Pulat. I really enjoyed our conversation today. Great way to uh, start off a Friday. Uh, so thank you so much for the experience and hopefully we can uh, chat again soon. My pleasure.